So back in June of 2012, if you were like me, you were glued to a Ustream feed of Mission Control at JPL, where there was a team of really, really super smart people landing a probe on Mars in a way that we never tried before. They flew in, and it hovered, and then they dropped a platform, and the thing just drove off. And because of the time delay between here and Mars, the time it takes light to travel, uh, they called it seven minutes of terror, because I think that was the amount of time it took to get a round-trip signal to see if it had actually worked. Um, in the background of that, we saw this guy with a mohawk. Um, and since then, I've gotten to know Babak Verdosi, and he's doing incredible work on software at JPL right now that I think we'll talk about later, maybe. But Babak, come on up, and uh, let's talk about the speed of light and radio. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I the clickers there. So this talk could also be uh, titled that my boss's 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 boss is also here tonight, so I won't be nervous at all. Um, but uh, yeah, let's talk about the, the speed of light a little bit. At first, just a little bit of background, a little reminder of uh, what, what uh, Will was talking about. So we start out uh, here going about 13,000 miles an hour at the atmosphere of Mars. Um, and the idea is to get from there to zero miles an hour without breaking a spacecraft. Um, that means you can't just crash it into the surface. Um, so we go there, we have a supersonic parachute, we have a rocket-propelled uh, landing system, a jetpack there that softly lowers the rover to the ground. Also that we can do a lot of science. Um, and there's a team of people who get really excited by things like that. <laughs> uh, what's really weird about that, for those of you guys who kind of look at that video, you think, oh, they're really celebrating those live action moments from Mars. But the reality is all that actually happened 14 minutes earlier. So by the time we got the first signal, that we entered the atmosphere of Mars, the rover was already on the surface for seven minutes. It was in one piece or another. We didn't know at the time, so we were celebrating. It's kind of like taking a really big test um, and only finding out the results like 15 minutes later. Um, so that was that night. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit about how, it, how we got there and how we operate vehicles that are that far away, because it's just the speed of light. That's the limit at which we're, we're kind of reaching here. So it begins with uh, our first American satellite, the Explorer 1, is also built at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, it was kind of in response to Sputnik. Um, and that is a whopping uh, 0.001 to 0 0.008 seconds away, depending on where it is in its orbit. For reference, when you're on a cell phone, the lag at which you begin to perceive that, oh, it's kind of weird to talk to someone, there's a little bit of a latency here, is 0.2 seconds. So it's very, very close, even though space seems like a great distance away. Um, but of course, the goal was to go to the moon. And the moon is noticeably farther. It's 1.3 seconds away. So if you send a command and you want to get a response, it's 2.6 seconds at least, depending on any latency in your, your spacecraft. But as we saw earlier, the Ranger spacecraft were our first attempts to go to the moon. They were um, very simple in design, relatively speaking. The idea was a camera pointed at the surface of the moon. We would fly to the moon. We would crash into the moon. And we would just basically take pictures uh, on the way there and send them back to Earth. So it's point camera at moon point solar rays at sun, point antenna at earth, three things. Um, and yet, one, two, three, four, five, six <laughs> failures <laughs> before we actually got it right. Um, so it's not trivial to start operating things that are, that are remote distances away. Uh, the Russians also had a, a space program. They had their own number of uh, failures as well before they had successes. Uh, but uh, they decided to focus on, instead of a human mission to, to the moon, they decided to focus on a rover um, to the moon. They sent two of these in the end. And the first one uh, had, had basically, uh, this is a, a picture of the first one, had cameras on the front, as you can see there. Uh, and these guys would be sitting in these very uh, dark control, mission control rooms with a closed circuit TV, and they would get an image every 20 seconds, and they would drive based on that 20 second interval. They would, so they saw a picture, drive a little bit, saw a picture, drive a little bit. It's only a few seconds away, so you can do that. By the second generation, they had gotten it down to three seconds. So pretty close. And these are the kind of pictures they'd be looking at. So you're trying to avoid hitting any of the rocks and things like that. Um, they actually lost the second one in the end by driving a little too fast and going into a crater. Um, they actually survived that part, which was impressive. But dirt got inside the, the rover, uh, covered up the thermal uh, radiators, and then eventually the rover cooked to death. Um, for those of you guys who are my generation, this is a little bit of a, a gap here. Um, it's a lot like the logo Apple II GS game. Um, you kind of drive forward a little increment, and then you can turn a little bit, and then you can drive forward. So we actually have a little demonstration for you guys tonight. So Will and uh, Jeremy here are going to show us a little excavator toy. Um, so for the first example, we're going to let Will actually do this. I mean, should you choose to accept this mission? Um, 
do this by operating and looking at the same time, and he'll send commands basically in, in near real time. Um, oh, am I on? Uh, so our friend Jerry Williams, who you may know from last year as the inventor of the game frame, the world's lowest pixel, lowest resolution pixel display, has rigged up a time delay Arduino-based setup so that I can issue commands, and then it'll wait a couple of seconds, and then it'll send them on. Um, so, Jeremy, I'm looking at this. I think that we need to go, like, let's say six feet forward, and then stop and see where we're at. I'm going to cheat just a little bit. You can't do that on the moon, I guess. No, you can't kick the rover yet. I think I probably should have not kicked it. OK, six feet wasn't enough. I'm going to kick it back a little bit so we don't drive <laughs> off the front of the stage. And then we're going to go, let's say, three feet and see where we're at. So this is kind of what the Russians did, right? This is what the Russians did. So basically, what they have, they have the opportunity to constantly update their vision and drive it based on that. Jeremy, one more foot ahead and then hang a left. We're trying to hit the pumpkin. That's an important thing that's to know. That's the goal, right. That's, yeah. the, that's the scientific object of interest. Yes. The pumpkin. Okay. Avoid the gnome. Now let's say four feet straight ahead. How did the Russians measure the distance? Did they just eyeball it? Well, they actually had stereo cameras on there, so they can get a rough estimate of distance based on that. I was off by one. Uh, turn right, and let's go forward. I'm going to blow right by it. OK, so it's a little yeah. trickier than it looks. It's a little tricky. But you got pretty close on I, this one. I feel pretty good about that. Pretty good. Okay. Um, we're going to change it up on you a little bit in okay. just a moment. I'm going to reset, and we'll come back in a minute. Yeah. Um, but of course, going beyond the moon, uh, we start getting to, you know, I, I would say the more interesting stuff in our solar system, like places like Mars. Um, but Mars is so far away that at the speed of light, it takes four to 20 minutes for a signal from Earth to reach Mars. So in our closest parts of our orbits, it's four minutes. At the far part, opposite sides of the sun, it's 20 minutes away. Um, and you have the challenge not just of driving something on the surface, but getting there. So I promise I won't make too many sports analogies tonight, but. Um, Here's a football reference for you. It's very much like a quarterback trying to hit a receiver. Both the quarterback and the receiver are moving. In this case, the earth is the quarterback, and our target is to throw the ball, and, or in our case, curiosity, um, to Mars, which is the receiver. Um, and just for reference, I'm going to show you a, a little short video clip sped up by a million times to show you the orbits of Earth and Mars during the time that curiosity was flying. So you can see Earth starts there on the, kind of the right-hand side, and Mars is up there at the top uh, left now. Or sorry, top right, and it's going to move all the way over during the course of this eight and a half months that we sped up to a few seconds. Uh, and Earth is going to go about two thirds away around the orbit, and Mars is going to go all the way over to the, the top left there, just about there. So during that time, the latency, in other words, the, the time at which it communicated from the rover, went from roughly zero seconds, meaning that it was just left Earth, uh, all the way to about 14 minutes. So you can imagine during the landing, we couldn't actually control the rover via a joystick like we did just here. We actually had to make that all autonomous. But let's say you did that part successfully, and uh, you get to the surface of Mars. You have a rover now. What do you do besides take a selfie on Mars? Um, well, the goal is to take some awesome science. Uh, in this case, we first stop for a 55 image selfie. Um, but you want to drive around Mars, you want to go to interesting places on the surface, you want to sample a variety of different rock types and histories of Mars. Um, and of course, we don't have roads to drive on on Mars, so we have to plan our, our drives accordingly. And this is what a drive might look like. Um, you, you drive, this is now you're, you're looking back on the drive in this case, so you have a drive coming in, you zag over here to look over these rocks, and then you turn, turn around a few times, I don't know why, and then you drive out this way. Um, and you, you can plan that drive because at this point I can see things pretty clearly. I can see it's a nice big flat terrain. Um, but you get to more interesting terrain, like this part here. And this is a, a, a dune that uh, Curiosity had to cross called Dingo Gap. Um, it was the shortcut to get to where we wanted to get to at Mountain Sharp. Uh, and you can start to see that we can see the terrain a little bit. We drive over the dune, and then eventually we lose sight of everything behind us. So you start getting to these issues. Um, and the way we have to work around this is we can't actually joystick this. All of this has to be planned uh, one Sol, one Martian day at a time. So in the morning, we send a set of commands, roughly 9 a.m., 10 a.m. The rover doesn't wake up too early. Uh, we're waiting for sunlight. Uh, we send the suite of commands for the entire day. The rover executes the commands. And then we see the results at around 3 to 4 p.m. when our orbiters pass overhead and relay the, the results back to us. So the images we see come back only at 4 p.m. Um, and so you have to drive a rover, essentially, without any clues as to how well the drive is going. And so we're going to demonstrate that uh, right here.
You're not going to let me watch this time, are you? Nope. Okay, I'm going to line it up. Jeremy, so, let's go 13 feet, then left 90 degrees. Okay. So he's going to queue up all the commands for the entire mission now, this one sol activity to get to you the got pumpkin. Th you're pretty sure you got 13? 13. Okay, 13 feet, turn left 90 degrees, and then let's go six feet. We're going big. Is that it? I, the, engage. <laughs> engage. Okay. Three, oh, yeah, 30 two, seconds. Yeah, we're, we're, we're making it fast for you guys. One, two, three, four, five. That one seemed fast. Six, seven, oh. Eight, nine. You're in right there. Ten. Watch <laughs> out, Dallas. Eleven. Dallas, give it a little out of help. Save the rover. <laughs> okay. I feel good about this. Little assist from the Martians. We made it. Look at this. Yes. It looks like you. You may have moved the rock a little bit. I feel okay about that. <laughs> that was, I mean, you're about to die off stage. Are, are you guys hiring? Yes. Uh, okay. Come on. Yeah. Okay, cool. Actually, you know what? There's the person to talk to is probably sitting in the audience. Oh, this is true, true, true. Thank you so much, Bob. We'll get out of your way. So, um, you may go to Mars and you're wearing your awesome spacesuit. <laughs> we actually have an expert on spacesuits. But, um, but one of the issues that you can quickly see is you can't see over the horizon. So if you're a rover driver and you're trying to plan your entire Sol's worth of activity, you could only drive as far as you can see. So you could drive up to that front hump and then you'd be stuck for the day. So instead, we give the, the rover some autonomy and the ability to drive. We can actually tell it to drive beyond what we can see. And the way we do that is we use stereo images. So the rover has a left and right camera. It actually has a lot of left and right cameras. There's both uh, navigation and hazard avoidance cameras. And it takes those left and right images and fuses them into a 3D stereo pair which allows it to actually create a local map. You guys all brought your red and blue glasses, right? Because I like, bring those all the time. Um, so now you have a 3D image of Mars, and the rover can process the image and create a map of what's kind of safe to drive on and what's unsafe to drive on. And you can give it a target in the distance, for example, that, that outcrop over there. And you can tell it to drive there, and it will actually create its own path. It's not necessarily as fast as a blind drive, because it actually has to process each time it updates, as it moves a little bit, it processes. Um, but in the end, you actually get to the target without having to see there. And that's a really big feature for us. So what you get is a result that looks something like this. You can see us driving and kind of avoiding features. These are tracks taken, uh, images of our, our uh, Curiosity there at lower left, um, uh, taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, and it takes these amazing down to 30 centimeters per pixel uh, images. So we're very thankful for that. Um, and you can see the tracks kind of, this is a multi-sol drive, so it actually took several sols to get from the top right there to the, the lower left. Um, but you can see what we can do. Now, my dream, of course, is one day that... Uh, that we can kind of see these tracks and look down and they'll actually be rover tracks driven by a human. And you can imagine that human sitting there on the surface of Mars and looking back at the Earth, but, you know, trying to communicate, share the experience with us. Um, but that Earth is, of course, 14 minutes away. So I want you to think about that the next time when you see things in the sky, that everything is actually a little bit different than it was a few minutes ago. And so I think it's kind of a beautiful thought to think that Earth isn't exactly in the same place anymore as when we took the picture, but it was 14 minutes ago, Earth. And so if you were here uh, on Mars and watching this presentation, you would still not be receiving the entire presentation. Thank you.